Some 14.7 billion years ago, our universe flared forth, eventually creating stars. A massive star shimmering for ages in a moment exploded into all the elements making up Earth. Long evolving Earth has borne increasingly complex forms of being in intricate, interconnected relationships. A self renewing community of moon tides, waters, the light of the sun, plants, air, soils, hydrocarbon filled bedrock, animals, including us. Humans are like and not like everything else in the universe, partly ancient and new, creative and destructive, knowable and unknowable. Our cities, too, are growing in calculable, patterned ways. Though they are never the same twice, they twinkle with mystery and potential. More than half of seven billion people now live in a swirling network of cities. Which are part beast, star, and imaginative handiwork reflecting who we are. Cities are a presence still expanding with humanity, wrapping the planet in lights, blanketing it in heat. Like animals, no two cities are the same. In Midtown Manhattan, smell roasting chestnuts. In Madiun, Indonesia, smell drying cloves. Like animals, cities also share patterning in common. As cities get bigger, they tend to get more efficient. Each citizen consumes less gas and produces less carbon emissions. Like stars, the more massive cities are, the faster and brighter they burn, in total dissipating more energy and carbon dioxide while generating more innovation. As in more schools and museums and art, as in increasing money wealth and spending more on new kinds of throwaway things, while spinning up rates of stealing, while income gaps between rich and poor, young and old, and among nations widen, and Earth's climate rapidly becomes less like any our 200,000 year old species has ever known, and harsher for future ones and other kinds like sparrows, herons, and cherry trees. Like Earth's moon reflecting sunlight, what cities imagine, do, and become mirror human desires. That is, cities conserve and generate what and who we value, the nature of our relationships. And they burn feverish now, dominated by self-want, overdosed on fossil fuels, cratering Earth like its moon. But other worlds are possible. In the 21st century, the condition of cities is the condition of Earth. An urban ethic is an Earth ethic. An Earth ethic is a life-encompassing community ethic of self-organizing generativity, reflecting a cosmos embedded within us, shimmering with tensions, making patterns, unpredictable, creating more relationships than we destroy. An Earth ethic is an ethic of empathetic engagement. It opens into a democracy of voices, respecting with deepening intimacy each unique being maturing in relationships, the wisdom of every local community, the intelligence of the whole cybernetic planet embedded within its cosmos. This ethic practices complex conversations involving giving, taking, losing, and keeping, transforming cities. In the game of hearts, shooting the moon means taking a risk to win. It means reaching for the nearly impossible. As 20th century American conservationist Aldo Leopold once said, that the situation is hopeless should not prevent us from doing our best. As urbanizing humanity crosses the threshold of the harshest global climate we have known, I found myself humbly seeking deep wisdom from cultures long evolved in harsh regional climates. The Yukagir of northeastern Siberia are one of the oldest of their vast region. They also are one of the most keenly suffering climate change injustices because of far off cities, not to mention a complicated history of tribal Russian, Soviet, and corporate mining impositions. On the other hand, what penetrating insight can we resurrect from long cityed cultures, enlightening as expanding flocks of far flung people flux inward toward urban living? 
How may the stories of each resonate in practice with personal hopes, complexities of others' perspectives, Earth's creative capacities for self-renewal? Vasilij Shalugin, a Yukagir born in the 1930s on the banks of the Kolomar River, was forced as a boy to attend boarding school under Stalinist orders, far from home. He remembers Earth then as a place of feared strangers and warm shoes. The shining moon seductive was, he dreamed, a land piled high with lollipops, lying like pebbles in piles. One night, he and some friends rode down the dark river, shooting arrows at the moon glowing red, and they hoped to bring it down, climb on, take some candy, and get off. The boys heard something fall and approached them. Shalugan became scared they might make the moon drown and it would die. He also knew the moon sometimes took people for herself, not allowing them to return to Earth. Later, the boys' elders teased them, and Shalugan felt foolish about the greedy lollipop venture. When a Yukagir hunter is hungry, she may say to the master spirit of the plentiful river, give, and her hunt is successful. When a hunter has been given an overabundance of prey, a spirit may turn to him and say, give, taking the hunter's life or his child. The election of Yukagir Nikolai Shalugin as leader over his people's post-socialist cooperative in 1991 put him in charge of a pile of tractors, cars, snowmobiles, and horses much more than one man could know what to do with. So his people turned up saying, give. He did so until the cooperative was bankrupt, and Shalugan had less stuff than anyone else, but piles of friends. The old um, Yukagir hunter, Spiridon Spiridonov, as Danish anthropologist Rain Willerslev tells his story, was rocking his body back and forth. I was puzzled whether the figure I saw before me was a man, or moose, Willerslev says. The hunter's fur clothing and skis covered with smooth moose leg skin made him look and sound in the snow like a moose. Yet below his fur hat, complete with protruding ears, were his human eyes, nose, mouth, and hands holding a rifle. Seduced by the empathetic image of herself as a seductive moose, a cow with her calf drew near to spirit on. He shot them both, food to give. Later, the hunter explained that he had seen two people dancing towards him, a beautiful young woman and her child. The woman sang to him, wooing him to come home with her. It was at that point, old Spiridon says, I killed them both. If he had gone with her, she would have killed him. Sometimes an animal's spirit, like the moon, may have desire for a hunter so much that she takes him to herself. A rash hunter seduced by an animal may sometimes kill himself to go with her. Over there, look, our tracks from moose running along Yura's place along the riverbank. Running, running, a hunter tells his friends back in their cabin. They all tell stories. You can't live without talking, they say, or you may turn into a so-called hairy one, neither human nor moose nor moon. This is madness. As a young woman, Akulina Shalugin, wooed a large tree into becoming her guardian by dancing and singing to her, the tree showed consent by the gentle movements of her branches in the wind. Bound together, when one dies, the other will die too, the old grandmother explains. Unless some accident or evil takes place, the spirits of beings, humans, moose, larches, rivers, perhaps moons and earths too, will return to their type's own drawer in the land of shadows to await rebirth into their people's particular sort of body with its, their particular experience in the world um, in a particular, its own particular type of way, giving, taking, losing, keeping, and storytelling. The body in which some Yukagir women desire to live some modern Yukagir women, responding to decades of Sovietization and the seductions of urban life, is one that will be appreciated for its beauty. A body helpful in seducing men who will pay their ways to the glittering adventures of a far off city which they have never seen themselves, but for which they fierce, ferociously dream. A woman named Diana has stripped off her clothes in Manhattan Central Park. They, in the contents of a bag, are spread in an arc in the grass around the bench where she's sitting overlooking a pond, which is reflecting a slice of low moon. It seemed to the man watching that this Diana felt summoned by the moon. She was waiting to be assumed into the lunar sphere, Italian author Italo Calvino dreams. 
The man follows Diana when she rises to follow the moon, her hands held up as if trying to protect something fragile. The woman too, the man thinks and feels, is vulnerable. He must protect her somehow, holding his hands out toward her, daring not even to graze her skin. Nobody can help, she says. Then, is it the end, the man asks? It's the beginning, Diana says, as she runs off across the lawn. It's the beginning of the end, or something else is beginning. The woman now perches on the trunk of the man's car. They pursue the moon and the sky, which lost seems to be blowing about like a dry leaf, yet as heavy as an old, holy rind of cheese about to fall and crush everything below. As the man speeds on, he sees on the roof of every other car, like his Diana, a different girl crouching, hair blowing, pointing at the moon. The traffic follows until the moon stops at the edge of the city in front of a scrapyard. Here, it is as if earth and moon are acting as mirror images of each other, the amalgam of wreckage and the decrepit moon. As the dying planet hangs there, the now shivering crowd of Dianas forms a circle. The women raise their arms together, which seems to encourage the moon, who appears for an instant to climb again. Was this what the moon had asked of them? Meanwhile, city authorities had become disturbed by Earth's old, worn-out satellite. As shoppers scanned the flashing ad screens overhead, the paling moon reminded them that all the stuff they were buying would end up in the trash heap, and that was bad for business. And while no one blamed the moon entirely, with a surprising remnant of force, it had made Superstorm Sandy flooding worse, raising the ocean tide while hidden full in October Hunter's moon behind the raging whirl of wet clouds. So, government officials were ready when the failing moon stopped over the dump. With a large crane and net and mining tools, they pulled it from the sky and nailed it to the ground. Since scientists had just discovered water trapped in moon rocks, the officials had workers dig out and load the most valuable ones into large trucks before backing away. Amidst the other discarded objects in the trash heap, amidst the dark spots that make bright city lights appear brighter, lived a community of discarded people. Bearded, unkempt, of all colors and ages, many bizarrely dressed. Dwelling here too were shadows of the island's first humans, Lanap, who know the moon as first mother of humankind, empowering them to dream. The other members of their long interwoven community, sky, wolf, raccoon, deer, passenger pigeon, clear stream, mud turtle, brook, trout, blackberry, rare club moss, Hollis soil, Manhattan schist, all together supported the Dianas, freeing the moon who rose up to lead the swelling host of enchanted broken peoples and scrap things down toward the most moneyed neighborhoods of the city along Fifth Avenue, where it just so happened con the Consumer Day Parade was also marching. At Madison Square, the two throngs, rusty old things and shiny new ones, merged into one. Old things became new, and new old, so mixed up as to become indistinguishable. Onward, the moon led to the Brooklyn Bridge. From its height, she crashed into the river, pulling under the girls who had been holding onto ribbons attached to her as to a gigantic balloon. Out the moon rose once again, now high into the sky, now different in a very different sort of way, dripping a trail of green, glistening seaweed, gushing with spouts of emerald water, covered with what looked like many-eyed peacock feathers from which the Dianas swung in hammocks. The crowd of young, frenzied mammoths left behind galloped off across the transformed earth, trumpeting, now is when life begins, and yet it is clear that what we desire, we shall never have. Soon after I moved to Manhattan, the moon hunted me in Central Park. In the March darkness, surrounded by millions of people, it was just me and the full sap moon shining in the reservoir, its soft light mingled with watery sheaths of the gl city's glimmering red, yellow, and blue lights. The moon followed me in an arc over my head as I coursed around the running track. The moon reflected my desire both to feel belonging and to stand out in the crowd, and for something more. I said the moon was following me, or was it I following the moon, hoping to seduce her by reflecting her desire to belong in the city and stand out in the crowd and for something more as I orbited my well-traveled ellipse. 
At night, I dream myself desiring tall cranes unreachable across a gully filled with sewage and of orange and black birds whirling around in a kaleidoscope and of a dog with purple eyes and violet nose, cloven paws and garden rose, voice like stardust bays the dawn when the moon shines amber fawn. Madness? That's why I'm telling you the story. Remember Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream, where in moonshine, the actor playing the moon in a play within the play asked both audience, audiences to imagine him, imagining himself actually dwelling in a lantern, which is the moon, along with a thorn bush and his dog. And then it ends. People fold up their playbills and return home to talk over breakfast. As if summoned by her, longing after her, I've wanted to live within that strange moon which generations not so distant have believed to be occupied with candy souls in cities, haven't you? But the moonshine of Central Park also reflects on white-throated sparrows singing in the dawn snow, blushing springs, black-crowned night herons fishing in the water's edge, and raccoons making out amidst yellow daffodils, cherry blossom petals falling on the dusty path, and someone piling up and shaping them into a plump little man. He survived to the next day, thousands of feet somehow knowing how not to disturb his pink light being. My moon ache is the humanizing story of my belonging to Earth, recalling me to myself and city, a city I desire to be such that the moon feels at home there too. This is wealth. So, I stepped out of my classrooms and into the streets, into the sunlight to do things I had never dreamed of doing with others I had never imagined meeting, doing things they had never imagined dreaming of doing with others they had never imagined meeting, singing, swapping stories, and making new ones happen. Ones that no one could make alone, but require every unique being to unfold, including you. There is a city of possible beings within each one of us. There is within each city the possibility of every being. What shall we, our cities, our earth, round of rock, water, plant, sunlight, soil, oil, gas, air, animal, moonshine, moral consciousness create, and how? It is the end for many, so many. Earth and its members are suffering catastrophically, reflecting the domination of some over others imposing simplistic desires for generating money over truly enriching ones for all unique life. As a shimmering star along holding together within the tension of gravity and fusion implodes or explodes if either comes to dominate, so too goes it with our cities, so goes it with the world of life as we've known it and ourselves. What happens when there are no more of your type of body Woolly mammoth, ancient soils, Huya's fluted song, golden frog, Delaware River, Great Barrier Reef, polar bear, Yangatri Glacier, Cowrie Rice, Moose, Yukagir, Sanfordian, New Yorker, Nikolai Shalugan, Trayvon Martin, Arthur Kasparik. What happens when there's no more of your type of body for your spirit to be born into? Dear human being dreamer, hear their voices. Keep your own. Lose what you don't need. Take your, doing, take your turn doing what all can do. Give what only you can give. Do this together. A 21st century urban ethic is a life-encompassing earth community ethic, meaning that a practice encouraging self-organizing gener generativity is right, creating more relationships than we destroy a practice fostering empathetic engagement is right, deepening respectful intimacy with others. A practice that doesn't do both is wrong. We do not consent to domination, but earth-becoming cities are fueled by each other, energetically advancing love. That pulsing thing we desire cannot live without and can never have.